space to form our unified command. Set out some principles and priorities for us to follow. And the number one thing that we started with was we do search and rescue for potential survivors and victims. And then we wanted to ensure that we protected the port in Maryland from any potential threats. And in those, in that case, we have how do we bring commerce to the port of Baltimore? And then the fourth line of effort, sir, was really how do we support the investigation? And that's really how do we ensure we're collaborating with them, sir, so that the investigation does not interfere with salvage operations and salvage operations do not interfere with the investigation. Over the top of all that, sir, is our number one priority, and that was safety of the public and safety of the first responders. Sir, on the restoration of commerce to the Port of Baltimore, there are three major efforts. The first of those is to clear the federal channel. That's located right here, and General Lloyd will brief you on that in just a second. The second part of that is we want to remove the ship, uh, sir, and we're going to, that'll be the second thing we do. And then the third thing is we want to continue to clear the bridge debris from the waterway, sir. In addition to that, in, as part of our efforts to restore commerce, we have opened two alternate channels. Those are smaller draft, for smaller draft vessels, tugs and barges, and combined with the trade point facility, that's going to equate to about 15% of commerce that had moved through the port previously is now reopened, sir. And so the, there's a channel to the north just under the first standing span on that side. That's an 11-foot draft, and there's a channel to the south, and that's a 14-foot draft. And again, those are for smaller tugs and barges to come in and out of the port. And then our plan is to continually, as we get sections of the bridge removed and waterways open, to continue to open either alternate channels or put in place restrictions so that we can continue to increase the amount of commerce that can flow in and out of the port at those stages, sir. So now I'd like to turn it over to General Lloyd, sir. Thanks, sir. So I'm Brigadier General John Lloyd. I command the North Atlantic Division for the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. You gave us the priority to open the federal channel. Sir, honored to serve, absolutely. You gave us the priority to open the federal channel again and get the Port of Baltimore uh, operational. What I can tell you, sir, is I am extremely confident we are going to make that happen. And why do I say that? Two reasons. First, the mobilization of people and equipment. The best I've seen, Mr. President, team uh, on the ground. We were able to have an agreement with the Navy and the supervisor of salvage, immediate in place, and mobilize that asset to get them on site at the same time the state of Maryland was mobilizing their assets to work on the non-federal channel, along with the cooperation. Again, the best I have seen uh, with this team in the Unified Command uh, with the Coast Guard uh, and our partners. The second, uh, technical and engineer expertise. Competency they bring to the uh, to do salvage operations is absolutely the best in the business at doing this. We're going to focus in two areas to open up the federal channel. First, Mr. President, we're going to open a limited access channel, 280 feet wide, 35 feet deep, by removing this section, and I'll just point it over here for you, Mr. President. This is the section I'm talking about right in here. Uh, both what's above the water and then below the water that I'll talk to in a minute, all the wreckage and debris is going to get us to those dimensions uh, to allow uh, vessel traffic back into the port. Historically, about 80% of vessels coming into the port uh, will be able to use that 280 foot by 35 foot uh, channel that we're going to open, 74% of outbound traffic. Uh, so that's good. Will this be removed in the meantime? Sir. Great question, Mr. President. So nothing that we are doing is happening sequentially. Everything in this operation is have, uh, happening at the same time through all the salvage operations. So the work that the state of Maryland is doing outside of the channel, uh, inside the federal channel with our contractors, they are engineering solutions and co coming up with those solutions to remove all of it simultaneously. So for this section that you point out, Mr. President, 
just to give you reference, this is the section sitting on uh, the vessel dolly. Uh, that section, I, I think General Spellman uh, may have briefed to you, about 5,000 tons, uh, 120 feet high. Mr. President, I have been out there and looked at it, and it is a lot of bridge resting on that vessel. Uh, the salvage experts are working right now to engineer a solution to cut that section of the vessel uh, and lift it. Get that done, the vessel will be able to be refloated uh, and recovered out of the channel. Right now, the majority of it is, it is sitting out of the federal channel. It'll get out of the way. We will remove the rest of the wreckage, Mr. President, and we will open up the federal channel. So I want to talk to you about what uh, you can't see under the water now. So it, you can see and look at all the wreckage above the water, and <clears throat> that's very clear. Uh, so what you're looking at now, Mr. President, is a 3D scan of underwater. Uh, again, as a reference point, the red is above the water, and it's this section sitting right here. Uh, below the water, the debris and wreckage is sitting uh, in the 50-foot channel. This cross-section is, is right what you're looking at there, Mr. President. Uh, it has been described by the salvage expert and the divers that that wreckage is a mangled mess uh, down there of a lot of steel uh, and a lot of force this on that. This is steel? Uh, this is steel, concrete, and uh, gotcha. debris at the bottom, Mr. President. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I want to talk to you about the great work that the divers are doing down the, in a very dangerous uh, environment in that wreckage. Uh, the divers go down, they are tethered to a barge, and with zero limited, uh, z zero visibility, uh, they are working in this environment. Uh, with someone talking into their ear uh, on the surface and guiding them uh, in the channel amongst the debris uh, where they can't see. They do a lot of it by feel. And what they are collecting is the data to determine how we are going to cut and lift all the wreckage and debris out of the channel. Mr. President, I'm going to go back here. Yes, sir. This is broke. This, this is separate. Sir, it is. Gotcha. And, a lot, and that, that's a great question as well. When we were first looking at it and with the uh, the data is shown us by sending divers into waters to make the determination that th this is separated yeah. here. Which to, uh, once we made that determination, that, that is helping us then uh, get that limited access channel that I talked about. So I've got 51 divers on the team, uh, 12 cranes on site. I have everything I need uh, to get this uh, federal channel back That's open for you in the nation. Other places. Yes, sir. Thank you. Sir, do you have any other questions? No, I do. The, the cooperation is fantastic. <clears throat> the best I've seen, Mr. President. You got the best cover in work. And Mr. President, that unified command approach is really is what allowing us to move as quickly as we are, because each agency brings to bear their authorities, their expertise, their capabilities, and their equipment, and we merge them together so that we create unity of effort and coordination and collaboration throughout. And that creates speed in any major response, sir. And this team is working great, sir. Yes, sir. Governor's a former Army guy, too, Mr. President, so it makes it easy to work with. I was trained well. <laughs> yes, sir. This guy's got guns as big as my thighs. <laughs> Mr. President, so I'll take you over to the next brief okay. unless you have sir. other questions, sir. Oh, I'm honored, Mr. President. Thank you for the opportunity. You're the best in the world. Thanks, sir. We're going to get this done. Thanks, sir. Thanks, sir. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Mr. President, uh, three things I wanted to give you. We're going to take a little further lens, if we could. I want to give you a sense of the impact uh, that this has had on our system, both our highway system and our port system. I want to talk about the immediate actions that we've been taking and then I want to talk about rebuilding the bridge. So just big picture, sir, this is the Baltimore area. This is the Baltimore Beltway. This is the Francis Scott Key Bridge, which is here. We have three crossings of the harbor, Francis Scott Key Bridge, Baltimore Harbor Tunnel, and Fort McHenry, roughly 250,000 vehicles a day. I was one of those vehicles about 1,000 times. Last I, know. I know. You and thank you for the toll, sir. <laughs> <laughs> you did stop and pay the toll, so I want you to know that. 
So um, as you can see, this bridge serves both communities and particularly the workers that work in this area. So that's a challenge that we will have going forward. It is a relief valve for these two bridges and actually the beltway. If anything happens on the beltway, people then gravitate to these three sources, obviously the two tunnels as well. And it's also the hazmat route. So any vehicles that are, are too high, too wide, or with, with dangerous materials, uh, they use this facility. Now they can't do it. They can't go through the harbor tunnels. So now they have to go around the beltway. So that's adding roughly about 30 minutes in time for that and obviously create some other issues for that. So those are types of things we're dealing with on the highway system. In terms of the port itself, uh, clearly we have roughly 8,000 people a day that would show up in those locations every day to report to work, 20,000 that were dependent upon the Port of Baltimore and roughly 50,000 in total that were supported by the Port of Baltimore. Huge economic impact, not only here, but nationally. Roughly 27 uh, states that we serve directly out of here, all the way out to the Dakotas we service. The number one auto, uh, as you know, the number one auto uh, a processing unit uh, in the United States, about 15% of all autos come through here in the Baltimore. And all the heavy equipment, I mean farm equipment, big construction equipment comes through here. Over 30% of that comes through. of some of the immediate actions, our police officer here you're going to meet in a minute, they were the first on the scene. They, they, they basically stopped traffic from something much worse. They went out and rescued a gentleman uh, from, from the, the wreckage. And basically, our dispatchers were professional all the way through and made sure that service was out there immediately and maintained. They've done a fantastic job. We initiated the uh, Unified Command actually in this very building. They're just sitting in this room roughly by about 2.30, three, about 3 o'clock in the morning. This was where the, the central heartbeat was, where we ran the whole operation, uh, particularly with the Maryland Chief State Authority Police running that. Then we mobilized. We were fortunate we had a, a company that was on contract. We immediately got them out here with cranes, with barges, with men. They knew how to do this. And then working through Unified Command, they've been basically opening those smaller channels. So they've been doing that. We, we will continue to work with uh, our partners on the outside. We have trade which is just outside of the impacted area, in effect, both to stage where we're going to put salvage, but also to try to get more jobs and keep things flowing through the port until it's totally open. The $60 million that we got through emergency relief is what's funding all that. So those openings that you saw earlier that was just pointed out, that was done with that $60 million. The traffic issues that we're dealing with was that $60 million. So thank you so much. We could not have gotten onto this as quickly as we did without that $60 million. In terms of rebuilding, we're working very closely with the Federal Highway Administration. Basically, now how do we get this done as quickly as we can, and environmentally as we can, to deal with the, the, the new standards that we'll have to meet with this? Let's get all that front lined up now so that we can get this thing open as quickly as we can because we've got to serve those people that work here at the port and the region as a whole. With that, I'll turn it over to the Secretary Buttigieg. Thanks, Paul. So, Mr. President, on day one, you directed us to do everything possible to support the state of Maryland from a DOT perspective. That has mainly meant supporting the Maryland DOT on four lines of effort. Help them get the port back open, deal with the supply chain implications in the meantime, help them get the bridge back up, and deal with the surface traffic implications in the meantime. As Paul mentioned, the $60 million was the first wave of emergency relief funding. We were able to turn that around within hours of it coming in. That is a down payment and just the beginning, but as more requests come in, we'll make sure that we can turn them around right away too. When it comes to supply chains, a, a number of the mechanisms that you established to deal with the issues we had in 2021 on the West Coast are serving us well now on the East Coast. Uh, as you know, this is the top vehicle handling port uh, that we have in the United States. Uh, the ports of Davisville, Rhode Island, uh, as well as uh, Virginia and Brunswick in Georgia have been able to uh, temporarily absorb much of the traffic that would have been headed uh, for Baltimore. Uh, but there's no long-term substitute, of course, uh, for the work that's done right here in Baltimore. When it comes to containers, most of that's getting picked up at the Port of Virginia and New York and New Jersey. Uh, and then when it comes to heavy equipment, there's some specialized ports absorbing that traffic too. Uh, but the focus is, of course, to support Baltimore and make sure they can get back up and running. Yesterday, we were able to execute a revised grant agreement from our maritime administration with the county of Baltimore. That relates to the Sparrows Point uh, trade point facility. You'll notice 
this is the only major component of the Port of Baltimore that sits outside of the block area. They have 10,000 vehicle per month capacity. We're going to be able to help them get up to 20,000. Basically, it requires paving about 10 acres of land here uh, to add to their cargo laydown capacity. Uh, so by doubling that, we'll be able to provide some relief uh, while they're, uh, uh, the Army Corps and the uh, state are getting the channel back open and uh, traffic back to normal. We're also providing some regulatory relief on the trucking side to uh, help with hours of service requirements for trucks that are involved in the response and uh, any other requests that come in. Great first responders that came on day one and were just tremendous, sir. And I want to first and foremost thank President Biden for his unwavering commitment to our neighbors and to all of our communities here in Greater Baltimore. From the very first hours of this tragedy, the President and his team, including Secretary Buttigieg, Secretary Su, Maryland's own Tom Perez, and countless others, have provided clear, compassionate, and around-the-clock support. I cannot tell you how much it means to have this level of support in one of our region's darkest and most challenging moments. Mr. President, thank you again. Thank you also to our governor, Wes Moore, for his steady leadership amid this unfathomable disaster. Thanks also to our outstanding federal delegation and to my partners in progress, Mayor Brandon Scott, County Executive Stuart Pittman, as well as all of our local partners for their steadfast support. 
these are challenging moments that remind us just how interconnected we are. And as we stand here today, for me and countless others who grew up in this very community, we continue to grapple with the loss of a bridge that represented a lifetime of connection. We continue to mourn those we've lost, hardworking members of our community who are simply pursuing a better future, just as we continue to pray for their families and loved ones. And with each passing day, we better understand and are responding to the immense impact that we have seen to the livelihoods of so many of our residents who rely on the Port of Baltimore. Dock workers, truck drivers, small business owners, and more. But even as we stand here today, we recognize that we are literally a community forged by steel, a community that helped build bridges all over this country, a community that helped win world wars. And that same steel resolve remains as resolute as ever in this most recent challenge. This tragedy will not define us. This wreckage will not divide us. As the president has said, this will take time, but it will get done and we will rebuild together. And we can do that because we have a president who has our back. Mr. President, thank you again for being here and for all that your team has done and will do. We appreciate you so much. I'd like to welcome next the mayor of Baltimore, Brandon Scott. Good afternoon and thank you, Mr. County Executive. I want to thank each and every one of you for being here to show up for Baltimore in this devastating moment in our history. As you can see behind me, the physical impact of this tragedy is massive. But let's be clear, the human impact is immeasurable. And as I've said every day, our focus is and always will be on the human impact. Those who we lost, their families, and those impacted workers and businesses. Baltimore, this region, and this country will be grappling with the ripple effects for many, many, many days to come. But Baltimore is strong. We are built with tough grit, and we will rebuild and come back even stronger. This past week and a half, this incredible team has worked around the clock to ensure that we remain focused on the mission at hand. I'm incredibly proud to see how everyone in our community, every level of government, business, nonprofits, and everyday individuals have come together to wrap their arms around our community, especially those who lost loved ones and the families who continue to bear the brunt of this tragedy. We made a commitment to all of them that we will be here for them every step of the way and forever. And I know we all share a commitment to keeping that promise. As mayor, I'm not naive about the image of our city that has also been fostered by those who don't know it very well. This time feels very different. As we stare down, perhaps the biggest complex challenge of our lifetimes, we've shown the world what Baltimore is actually made of. Our love for one another, our commitment to our home, and the grit we have to see it all through. That is embodied by everyone represented here, from the county executives, our wonderful governor who's been leading our unified command, the best congressional delegation the mayor could ask for, the entire Biden-Harris administration, including Secretary Buttigieg, Vice President Harris, and President Biden himself. Every one of those people sees this city the same way I do, through the beauty it holds and the strength that our people exhibit. And we could not ask for better partners, and President Biden is the most important and the biggest partner in that work. He's been that way since day one of his term. Whether it's gun violence, tackling housing insecurity, or infrastructure, President Biden has been here for Baltimore. So I knew that night when I got that call from my fire chief that he would be here now, that he would make sure, as he said, he's moving heaven and earth to make sure that the Port of Baltimore is reopened, that the key bridge is rebuilt, because this is not just about Baltimore. This is about doing as he does each and every day, showing up for American people. I am so deeply grateful uh, for the partnership and strong leadership of President Biden, and I know that we will work together as we have through every single moment of this tragedy, together, uniform and unified, to make sure that we see it through. Thank you, Mr. President, for your leadership, your guidance, and your overwhelming support and love for Baltimore. 
Uh, but without further ado, I will turn it over to a member of that best uh, congressional delegation in the United States Congress, the man who literally gave me my voice, uh, Congressman Kwasi Mfume. Sir? Thank you very much, Mayor Scott. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Fate and circumstance has called us to this point. How we deal with it and how we get beyond it will depend on our grit, our resolve, and our belief that no mountain is insurmountable. I want to just take a moment to be deliberately redundant and to say to Governor Westmore how much we appreciate your leadership, your stewardship, and your friendship. He will be here in just a second to address all of you, but I can say, as I've said every day that I've been here, this is the best team that I think any t state could put in place to deal with a tragedy like this. I want to certainly thank President Biden, who called many of us just hours after this occurred to pledge in an unwavering way his support, his dedication, his commitment, his resolve to making sure that this bridge is rebuilt again, that these channels are open to commerce again, that the men and women of the unions, particularly the longshoremen and all of the independent businesses and others who have depended on this means of commerce will in fact survive again. I would be remiss if I did not say a word once about the Unified Command, the Coast Guard and the Army Corps of Engineers, who are right now as we speak doing what they must do with 51 divers in place under the bridge and over the bridge, helping to bring about the change that we are all waiting for. And I would be equally remiss if did I did not lift for our collective memories those persons that died on that bridge, those families that watched these proceedings and whose hearts break every night, those children who will never know their father as their father knew them, and to all of us who recognize that it could have been any of us, we pray to God Almighty that there is some sense of closure to all of this. So these are difficult, daring times, but we believe that we've got the right grit here in Baltimore and throughout the state of Maryland to deal with that. And may I just say also, lest we ever forget, this port is so significant to the nation that we love. I call on my friends, my colleagues in the Congress, to see this as a national tragedy, to recognize that supply lines all over this nation could be disrupted, to understand the severe effect that this would have on our economy, and to recognize, as we are just a couple of miles away, from where the Star Spangled Banner was written out there, right where that bridge stands, that at the end of the day, we are Americans. Black, white, Jew, Gentile, Asian, Latino, Native American, men and women who have always risen to the challenge. Let me, if I might, bring to this microphone a member of the United States Senate from the state of Maryland, our junior senator, who will soon be our senior senator, and someone like the person that he will introduce is fighting the good fight for all of us in the United States Senate. Please welcome Senator Chris Van Hollen. Well, thank you, Kwaizi, and thank you for being such an incredible, wonderful member of Federal Team Maryland. It's good to be with all of you today. I'm very sorry about the circumstances that bring President Biden to Baltimore, but it's always great to have the President of the United States, Joe Biden, in this great American city. Whether it be moments of triumph, a moment of tragedy, or a moment when we are going to grow from tragedy to triumph. Baltimore is a city that President Biden knows well. He's been here many times. He commuted through here from Delaware. As he will tell you, Biden ancestors came from Baltimore, and he knows that this is a great American city. That's what he told me. 
That's what he told Senator Cardin, Congressman Fume, the governor, the mayor, and all the others who the president called the day this bridge collapsed. And in those calls, he first of all expressed sympathy and support for the families and loved ones of the six men that we tragically lost that day. He said thank you to all of the first responders, the city level, the state level, and the federal level, recognizing the sacrifices they were making, putting themselves in danger as is being done right now in terms of the, the divers and others. But that day, he thanked those who helped prevent more people from dying in this tragedy. And he pledged to do everything in his power to help every single person impacted by this tragedy, to use the full power of the office of the presidency and the federal government to help the city. And he didn't only pledge his solidarity. By the time he made those phone calls, he had ordered, already ordered the federal government and its agencies to get to work. By that time, the Coast Guard was already on the scene working with other first responders, setting up the unified command. By that time, the president had already ordered the Army Corps of Engineers to begin to figure out how we're going to reopen the port by clearing the channel. By that time, he was also already working to find a way to make sure that the federal government steps in to help cover the costs of building a new bridge. The city of Minneapolis lost a big bridge in 2007. The America came together to help them, and the president has said America will come together to help Baltimore and Maryland at this time. And his team was already on it. You're going to hear from Secretary Buttigieg. I got a call from him at 3 a.m. that morning, and it was just one example of how the president's team sprung into action. The funds and setting up the funding for replacing the bridge through the emergency, emergency uh, relief program. You already heard that $60 million has come to the city of Baltimore and Maryland uh, to help deal with the impact of traffic pattern changes. And the president and his team will be working with us, first of all, to make sure that through that emergency relief program, uh, the federal government pays 90% of the costs and they're going to work with us to commit to the president's pledge of 100%. Senator Cardin, Congressman Fume, and I will be introducing legislation together with the administration to do that in the coming days. And finally, while the president has been doing all of this, first and foremost was to help with the people who are most impacted by this tragedy, the families of the six making sure we put our arms around and thank the first responders, and of course, help all those thousands and thousands of people who are impacted by what's happening in the Port of Baltimore as we clear the channel, including the longshoremen that we met with, many of us, just a short time ago. The Small Business Administration is providing emergency loans to every small business impacted by this. The Acting Secretary of Labor has been in Baltimore pledging support for the workers uh, who are not getting paychecks because of what's happening. Tom Perez is out of the White House has been here as well. So the president has committed to three things. Number one, partnership, working with our terrific governor and the governor's team, working with our mayor and the county executives, working with the federal level and all levels of government to get it done. And the message he has said from the beginning, from the beginning is we have to be there for the people most impacted by what happened. That has been the president's North Star. That's his North Star in Baltimore. That's his North Star in Maryland. That is his North Star for all of the American people. So I'm so proud that we have the president coming back to Baltimore. Sorry about the circumstances, but he will show that America always rises to the occasion and we will make sure that we come out of this strong. And one of the people who's been leading the way at the federal level has been the head of federal team Maryland. Ben Cardin may not be running for re-election, but I can tell you he is running 24-7 to help the great city of Baltimore and Maryland in this, in this hour of need. 
He has been a great partner. He's been a great friend. He's a great friend to all of us, a national leader. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Senator Ben Cardin. First, let me thank Senator Van Hollen for his extraordinary leadership on this issue and so many issues that affect the people of Maryland. He's a great partner for me to have in the United States Senate. We all have been in various stages of grieving during the last week and a half. This has been a tough time. I want to first thank our first responders. They saved lives. Six of our fellow Marylanders went to work on that day. They went to work to help build our infrastructure, make our roads safer, make America stronger, and to provide resources for their families. They did not return. They lost their lives. Our prayers, our thoughts are with the families, and we will always be there. President Biden made it clear from the beginning that he would be with the people of Maryland every step of the way. Thank you, President Biden. Thank you for giving us what we needed at that moment and every day since and continue to provide the support we need to recover from this catastrophic event. You established a unified command. You've heard my colleagues talk about this unified command. It is something that none of us had ever seen. You established a unified command. You've heard my colleagues talk about this unified command. It is something that none of us had ever seen really put off the way it was. We had the experts on every subject, but working together to complete the mission, to open our channel, to rebuild the bridge, to take care of the people and businesses impacted. This unified command led by our Coast Guard, our Army Corps of Engineers, Team Maryland, Governor Moore, what an extraordinary leader he's been during this event. We thank him for that. Mayor Scott in Baltimore, the work that he has done. County Exec Doshesky in Baltimore County, the work that he has done. County Exec Pittman in Anne Arundel County. It's been a team effort. As a result, we've made a lot of progress. And you heard the announcements today in regards to opening the channel and we're already planning for the replacement of the bridge. Thank you, Mr. President, for making that possible by providing the resources and the personnel without delay so we can make this type of progress. I also want to thank my colleagues in Congress on both sides of the aisle who have contacted us and offered their support. When you have a catastrophic event to a critical infrastructure, we come together as a nation and we will come together as a nation to make sure we do what is right. The key bridge, the Port of Baltimore critical infrastructures. Port of Baltimore, the third largest that we have, handles $80 billion of import-export every year. This is port powerhouse, and we know that, the impact it has. 8,000 direct jobs, thousands of more jobs are related to the Port of Baltimore. The impact on our community and our nation, President Biden understands that. From the auto dealers that depend upon the autos that are rolling off the ships here in Baltimore, to the workers that depend upon the plywood, the paperboard, construction equipment, aluminum, iron, steel, lead, animal feed, nickel, zinc, lead, and the list goes on and on and on that comes through the Port of Baltimore. This is affecting our entire country. President Biden knows this bridge. He's our neighbor from Delaware. He drives on that bridge. He understands the importance of it. And he also knows the importance of this bridge and our channel to our nation. He has made it clear that we will get all the resources we need to cover the needed costs for reconstructing, reconstructing the bridge. We, as has been pointed out, we've already received the emergency relief funds that have helped us get started. Now, I know there is a lot of talk about third-party liability and insurance. We will hold everyone responsible 
for the damages they've caused in the insurance proceeds, et cetera. That will help our taxpayers. But I want to thank the Biden administration for understanding we can't wait for those dollars. We've got to go to work now to make sure that we get the channel opened and the bridge reconstructed. In the 70 years, we've seen an incredible increase in capacity in our channel, in our roads, of about 3,000 percent. Our community is so we will come back, and we are certain about that. As our governor says, we're Maryland tough and Baltimore strong. We will reopen our channel. We will rebuild our bridge. On the day of the tragedy, I received a call from Secretary of the Transportation Buttigieg. Within hours, hours, he was here in Baltimore. He brought the full resources of the Department of Transportation his incredible team and his problem-solving skills to Baltimore, which has made a huge difference. We thank Secretary Buttigieg for everything he has done, and we're honored to have him with us today. Thanks, Pete. delegation that you do, led by Senator Cardin, Senator Van Hollen, Congressman Mfume, and all of those who are there on Capitol Hill day in and day out, making sure that this incident and anything of concern to the state of Maryland is addressed. I want to recognize and thank the first responders, Coast Guard, U.S. Army Corps, demolition and construction crews already hard at work in challenging conditions as they have been from the first moments of this matter. And I want to recognize the extraordinary leadership of Governor Westmore, who we have been working with very closely, along with the great work of Mayor Scott, County Executive Olszewski, and all of the state and local leaders who are here and their teams. And I'm particularly thankful for the leadership of the President of the United States, President Biden, who from day one set us up in a way that we could work swiftly and collaboratively across federal agencies and in partnership with state and local authorities, with labor and the private sector, all with the same goals, to get the port back open and the bridge back up. Over the last week, we have learned more. We have learned more about the six construction workers who lost their lives, men who were out on a cold night filling potholes, making repairs while most people were sleeping. They and their families are very much in our prayers. Over the last week, we have also learned more about the first responders whose bravery and quick thinking saved lives. And over the last week, the U.S. Department of Transportation has been working with urgency and creativity on our four main lines of effort to help Maryland reopen the port, to help deal with the supply chain implications until the port reopens, to help rebuild the bridge, and to deal with the surface transportation implications until the bridge is rebuilt. I can provide some updates on those lines of effort since we offered a briefing last week. Last Thursday, we approved Maryland's request for $60 million in quick release emergency funds. The state has the flexibility to use that funding in a number of different ways, including advanced procurement, design, and construction activities. They're using it to redirect traffic and support detours, to assist with bringing in barges to cut steel into pieces and remove it from the site, to remove wreckage outside of the federal channel, allowing for the creation of smaller auxiliary channels and more. And this, of course, is just the start of our financial support. We've also been very focused on the supply chain implications. President Biden's freight initiatives that were originally stood up in the face of COVID disruptions are serving us well here. For example, we've used data partnerships that did not exist prior to 2021 to monitor changing container volumes along the East Coast and help supply chain actors adapt. And with our multimodal freight office created by the President's bipartisan infrastructure law, last week we convened over 100 stakeholders from across our supply chains to better understand challenges they're facing and to coordinate on mitigations. While there are certainly impacts, we are increasingly confident about the availability of East Coast ports to step up temporarily to absorb much of the cargo diverting from Baltimore in the short term. We're also providing regulatory flexibility for truckers who are helping keep supply chains moving and supporting in the response. And we have had railroads at the table too. 
And just yesterday, we signed a revised grant agreement with Baltimore County updating the scope of a previously awarded maritime administration grant that benefits Trade Point, which is one of the few major port facilities here that sits outside of the block channel. The revised agreement will allow them to use those funds to expedite paving at least 10 acres that can be used for additional cargo laydown area. That work is already underway, and it will double their capacity to accept vehicles, which is one of the main types of cargo shipped through Baltimore, and a more difficult type of cargo to find substitute ports for than container activities that are more standardized. Opening the channel for the port, rebuilding the bridge, are both remarkably complex operations that can't happen overnight. But as President Biden has instructed from day one, the federal government will provide everything Maryland needs, funding resources, technical support, logistical help, and more to get that port open and get that bridge rebuilt. The President has also made clear that no matter anyone's affiliation, public, private, federal, state, local, Democrat, Republican, we are all one team here. That matters so much because there are so many different jurisdictional lines, different areas of expertise and ownership and authority. So breaking down any and all barriers, cutting red tape, and working as one continues to matter a great deal, and that's what we're doing here. Which is why, with that spirit of partnership and the commitment that I have seen here on the ground from the first hours, there is no doubt in my mind that Baltimore will come back stronger than ever before. Thank you very much.
pensamientos y nuestras oraciones. And 10 days ago, a piece of the Baltimore skyline and a piece of the Baltimore spirit plunged into the river. But the people of Maryland, we rallied. And I tell you, Mr. President, the city of Baltimore is stronger today than ever before. But our strength is not preordained. Marylanders have spent weeks, months, and years focusing on what unites us. Baltimore came together to improve public safety, and last year, we brought down homicides to the lowest rates that they have been in almost a decade. Baltimore came together to drive growth, and this year, we have one of the fastest growing economies in the nation. The hardworking people of Baltimore have been training for this moment, even if we didn't know it. Our unions, our first responders, our government leaders, our village elders, our business community, all of us have forged uncommon bonds, and partnership is what we do here. And partnership will help us to rebuild the bridge and win this moment. Today, we launch a new partnership with leaders in the public and the private sectors. It is called the Maryland Tough Baltimore Strong Alliance. The alliance is made up of leaders who are doubling down on their commitment to the city and their commitment to this state. Many have agreed to not lay off employees. Many, many have agreed to return to Baltimore even if they need to move somewhere else temporarily. And all have agreed to help us build a better future. Foundations businesses, sports teams, community champions have committed a combined $15 million thus far to support our workers and our neighbors in this moment. The Alliance is over 50 members strong and we are only getting stronger. Maryland is building a table that is large enough to include everybody, from our federal partners, to our nonprofit leaders, to our entrepreneurs, to our port workers. And this morning, I signed an executive order to provide $60 million in financial relief for workers and businesses that have been impacted by the key bridge collapse. Now, I know our state's largest city is being tested right now. But Baltimore has been tested before. We get knocked down, we stand back up, and we dust ourselves off, and we move forward. That is what we do. And the people, and the people of Maryland are grateful to have a full partner in this work like President Biden. Yeah. Yeah. I received my first call from the White House at around 3 a.m on the day of the collapse. And every hour since, we've worked hand in hand with this administration. President Biden might not be a Marylander by birth, but I tell you, he's proven what it means to be Maryland tough and Baltimore strong. The President stood with us in the first 100 days of our administration to announce historic funding for the Frederick Douglass Tunnel. And he stands with us today to help the families clear the channel, lift our people, and rebuild this bridge. With the support of President Biden and his team, I know that Marylanders of this generation and the next will look up and once again, they will see the Francis Scott Key Bridge, and they will see it standing tall. The state of Maryland is honored to welcome the President of the United States to one of the most important cities in the United States. Ladies and gentlemen, 
the 46th President of the United States of America, President Joe Biden. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Please, please, thank you. By the way, folks, I say to my dad, Dad, they're mispronouncing Balmer. <laughs> my dad and the Biden, please sit down. The Biden family goes all the way back to being watermen in this bay for a long, long time, back in the mid-1800s. And uh, my father uh, was born and raised here in Baltimore. And uh, there's a strong, strong connection. Still have family in the region as well. Governor Moore, Senator Cardin, Senator Van Hollen, Congress Mafumi, Mayor Scott, County Executive Johnny O. I like that. <laughs> Johnny O, ho, ho. <laughs> to all the military members and first responders, most importantly to the people of Maryland, I'm here to say your nation has your back, and I mean it. Your nation has your back. And you've got, without exaggeration, one of the finest delegations in the Congress of any state in the Union, Amen. and they know how to get things done, and we're going to get this paid for, aren't we? Yes. Yep. yes. All right. I was just briefed by the United Unified Command about the ongoing impact of this tragic collapse of the Francis Scott Key Bridge last Tuesday. The damage is devastating, and our hearts are still breaking. Eight, eight construction workers went to the water when the bridge fell. Six lost their lives. Most were immigrants, but all were Marylanders, hardworking, strong, and selfless. After pulling a night shift fixing potholes, they were on a break when the ship struck. Just seconds before, one of the men named Carlos, who was only 24, left a message for his girlfriend. Here's what it said. We just poured cement. We're waiting for it to dry, he said. Well, to all the families and loved ones who are grieving, I've come here to grieve with you. We all are. It's not the same, but I know a little bit about what it's like to lose a piece of your soul, to get that phone call in the middle of the night say family members are gone. I've been there. It's feeling like having a black hole in your chest, like you're being sucked in, unable to breathe. The anger, the pain, the depth of the loss is so profound. And we know it's hard to believe, and you're probably not going to believe me, but I can tell you now from personal experience, the day is going to come when the memory of your loved one as you walk by that park or the church or something that you shared together it's going to bring a smile to your lips before it brings a tear to your eye. It's going to happen. It's going to take a while, but I promise you it will happen. And that's when you know you're going to be able to make it. I promise you it will come. And our prayers for you is that time to come sooner rather than later, but it will come. We'll also, never forget the contributions these men made to this city. We're going to keep working hard to recover each of them. And you know, my vow is that we will not rest, as Carlos said, until the cement has dried on the entirety of a new bridge, a new bridge. <laughs> Earlier this afternoon, we took an aerial tour, a survey of the wreckage. You know, from the air, I saw the bridge that's been ripped apart. But here on the ground, I see a community that's been pulled together. I want to thank you all, the first responders, the port workers, state and local officials, trying into action before dawn, who have been here ever since. And we did talk, I think it was 2 or 3 in the morning. You were out here. You were here. Within minutes of the collapse, the U.S. Coast Guard arrived on the scene. Within hours, I ordered personnel from the Army Corps of Engineers, the Navy, the Department of Transportation to insist in every way possible. Within a day, we stood up a unified command. In the weeks to come, I want you to know we're going to continue to have your backs every step of the way. I guarantee you. I guarantee you. First, our first is our priority to reopen the port. This is one of the nation's largest shipping hubs, and it's the top port in America, both in importing and exporting of cars and light trucks. Be number one. 
Simply put, the impact here has a significant impact everywhere, up and down the coast and around the country. Thousands of tons of mangled steel remain lodged in the water, blocking ships from moving in and out of the harbor. I've, dis I've directed the Coast Guard, the Navy, and the Army Corps of Engineers, who are, by the way, the finest engineers in the world, and the state officials to work together to help remove this steel as quickly as possible and as safely as possible. So far, our team has been able to clear two small channels for essential ships helping clear the wreckage. And yesterday, the Army Corps announced that by the end of April, they'll be able to open the third channel for some commercial traffic, including car carriers. And by the end of May, we'll open the full channel, the full channel. My task force on supply chain disruption has been able to been engaging with union, rail, trucking, shipping, state and local leaders to minimize the impact on our supply chains. And I'm proud to announce that the federal government will provide over $8 million in grant funds to make the infrastructure improvements at Sparrows Point as the only port unaffected by this collapse, which will allow Sparrows Point to take on more ships. And that's happening now. It will happen shortly. Second, we're focused on protecting the workers and businesses. Folks, 20,000 jobs depend on this port. 20,000 families depend on this port to buy groceries, to make rent, to pay their bills. Today, my administration is announcing the first tranche of dislocated worker grants, fancy phrase, to, which is dimes. All it is there to make sure it, it helps create jobs for workers involved in the cleanup of this incident, additional jobs. My Small Business Administration has also issued a disaster declaration, which will allow the SBA to offer low-interest loans for small businesses impacted by the collapse in order to keep things moving. The state, the city, the county are also stepping up in impressive ways to help workers and businesses who have been affected by this disaster. But, folks, we all need to step up. Amazon, Home Depot, Domino Sugar, and many other companies all rely on this port. And they have committed to keep workers and payrolls on their and their businesses in Baltimore and move as quickly and clearly as possible to the channel. I'm calling on every company at and around the port to do the same thing, the same exact thing, commit to stay. And the customers who use this port, we're coming back. We're coming back soon. Folks, finally, we're going to move heaven and earth to rebuild this bridge as rapidly as humanly possible. And we're going to do so with union labor and American steel. For a simple reason, they're the best workers in the world, and that's not hyperbole. Every day, over 30,000 vehicles traveled across this bridge. And I was one of those people I commuted every day from Delaware for 36 years to Washington, D.C., back and forth and about one-fourth of that time by automobile. I've been to every part of this port. Folks, we now face a question no American should ever have to ask. How will I get to work? How will I go to school? How will I get to a hospital? Response and response, everyone, including Congress, should be asking only one question, and they're going to be asked the question by your delegation. How can we help? How can we solve that problem? My administration is committed, absolutely committed, to ensuring that the parties responsible for this strategy pay to repair the damage and be held accountable to the fullest extent the law will allow. But I also want to be clear. We will support Maryland and Baltimore every step of the way to help you rebuild and maintain all the business and commerce that's here now. As the Governor <laughs> As the governor can tell you, within hours of the, American the Maryland request, we approved $60 million in emergency federal funding. I fully intend, I fully intend, as the governor knows, to have the federal government cover the cost of building this entire bridge, all of it, all of it. As we've done in other parts of the country in similar circumstances. When I stand here, I call on Congress to authorize this effort as soon as possible. Let me close with this. This port is over 300 years old. 
As a matter of fact, as I said, my great-great-grandfather worked here as a waterman in this bay. This port is older than our republic and has been through tough, tough times before. During the War of 1812, a young Marylander named Francis Scott Key, to whom the bridge is named after, sat in a boat in this very harbor, and he watched. He watched the British troops launch an attack after attack on American forces. But as the dawn broke, we saw the American flag still flying. Baltimore was still standing, and our nation, as he rode in the Star Spangled Banner, had made it through a perilous fight. Folks, this is going to take time. But Governor Moore, Senator Cardin, Senator Van Hollen, Congressman Mafumi, Mayor Scott, County Executive Johnny O, and others are going to rebuild this bridge as rapidly as possible. And folks, we're determined to come back even stronger. We're the only nation that's gone through every crisis that we've had. We come out stronger than we went in, and we're going to do it here as well. And once more, to make this perilous challenge, this perilous challenge. You know, because we're the United States of America, there's nothing, nothing, nothing beyond our capacity when we do it together. Think about that. Remember who we are. We're the United States of America. Nothing is beyond our capacity. May God bless you all, and may God protect our troops, our first responders, and all those who gave their soul. Thank you, thank you, thank you.